Welcome back to Revelatorium, the podcast that comes around once a month, just about as often as I go to the Laser Dome, which is possibly the most erotic place in Seattle. And I used to describe it as like the most romantic place in Seattle, but I actually think erotic is the word because it is so focused on like pleasure in there. And don't get it twisted. I think a lot of people like in the last um, Rev zine we did, which if you don't know, there's a zine accompanying this. Um, it's linked in the show notes. Um, I was talking about how I had like an amazing session of pillow talk with my mom the other month. And the multiple people commented on the last podcast episode and were like, I was shocked to read that you had pillow talk with your mom because for me, that's perverted. It's like something you only do with like a sexual partner and I was like oh I've never it's never even crossed my mind that pillow talk would be guarded within the bounds of like sexual intimacy I guess I just think about I think about intimacy and eroticism and like romanticism in such truly an asexual way and I never really like put it together but a lot of people say that they like my podcast and my YouTube videos because I talk about intimacy and like connection and relationships in like not a very like heterosexual way because I'm not (laughs) um and I'm like coming to terms with that and I was listening to um I was listening to Maddie Drosbeck's podcast and someone commented that on hers as well and I was like maybe that's why I like emotionally online so much her her podcast because she also has a more like complicated view of intimacy than just like sex is the way you get it and that's the portal through which you receive all of your like eroticism and intimacy. I'm like, no, because I don't really like I'm not really focused on like sexual attraction. Um, I find eroticism and intimacy in like all these other ways. And I also think people just like even if you're not asexual, people have a very limited like definition of intimacy for example like pillow talk like why would that only be with a sexual partner for me that's like whoever I commented and replied and was like whoever's head is on the pillow next to yours that person qualifies for admission into pillow talk land like why why would I not want to have pillow talk like to me it's just like pillow talk is not because you've had sex that you're able to do it pillow talk is because like the the remains of the day have like worn away you're about to go to sleep. So all of your inhibitions are down. You're like really relaxed. You're not as on, you're not performing and you can release more vulnerable or like revealing things. You can confess more things. And it's the same thing as sleepovers. Like the things that you can say to each other at a sleepover, you get to a more, you get more depth when you, you know, are with somebody a whole night. Seeing how someone sleeps itself, no matter if you've hooked up with them or not is a very intimate thing you know I don't let everybody see that but it's like when I have a first sleepover with a friend it's like oh this is this unlocks a new level of it for me so I'm like I don't know it just kind of like in a way I'm like it's fine if you get all of your intimacy and pillow talk from sexual stuff but I'm like why would you why would you limit you know why would you limit happy to an hour why would you limit intimacy to sex that's just like so boring to me I'm like there's so many other like more surprising ways to get it and like one way I get it is by going to the laser dome which if you are the 10 percent of people here that are on my patreon maybe you've you're familiar because I vlog it like um I vlogged it for vlogmas and talked about it because it just like means a lot to me it's one of the first places that I ever visited when I um came to Seattle um, so many years ago, just as like a, you know, a a visitor, a vacationer. And uh, it was told it was it was it's such a it's such a communal place to me. I was um, reading this tweet about how Kurt Vonnegut had this theory about how um, celebrity culture is going to sort of like ruin our sense of like community and it's it's attributing to a lot of the loneliness epidemic he was really prophetic in that way he said that many many decades ago i think in the 80s maybe um this is where the fact check comes in um which is why i have that because i don't want to be spreading misinformation rampantly but basically he said that like us being so focused on celebrity culture and a lot of us being up in the business of someone we don't even know and spending our time focused on them which is like so disconnected from us is taking us out of like going to local shows, local events showing up. And like yesterday was a day where I went to like a comedy show that a couple of my friends were performing in. And then I mean, my friend like went to another community event, this like sale in my old neighborhood. 
and um, saw my old boss from like my night when I worked retail uh, for like a month. That's part of my lore. I also realized there's a lot of people here. They're not a lot of people here, but also once a month, what I was going to say at the top of this episode, because it's actually a struggle for me to think of like what happens once a month now that I've gone through all the like standard, like your period, the moon, etc. I was thinking about once a month, somebody will tell me that they found my podcast because somebody told them about it and they've never like watched my YouTube videos. And I'm like, this is to me, that's such a marker of success. I'm like, wow, I've broken out of just folks that have the parasocial relationship to me. It's like people that were not familiar with me. There's some there's some social value I create on this podcast, I do dare say. Um, But if you don't know my lore, basically, I quit my corporate job was kind of unemployed but like doing part-time social media and then I picked up another part-time job doing retail for like a month while I had literally like a broken foot I was recovering from it was like such a such, that was such a time capsule as time where I'm just like every and I had red hair everything's like very locked into that time period but December 2020 um two I vlogged on vlogmas you can go over to patreon it's like three bucks to see it um and you'll have like literally 25 videos if you're looking for something to to put on while you wash the dishes or whatnot. Um, anyway, I uh, I talk a lot in... Oh, yeah, I went to that local local shopping event, saw my old boss. Like It was just nice to see everybody in one room in this like community center. And obviously, I'm not like consumerism is the best way to create community. I just mean that like, you know, I showed up to a local event and then we went to the Laser Dome, which like... Do I talk to the other patrons when I'm there? No. But still, even wordlessly, it just feels sweet and endearing that all these people found this place because it's not very common. Like, do you know what a laser dome is? It's not very common. Seattle is the only city that I have been to a laser dome in. And I talk to the laser artist because there's someone that like live basically projects and designs and like choreographs and like DJs like these laser designs along to like an hour of music last night was mac miller rest in peace it was amazing the guy next to me knew every fucking word i like looked over he was like stimming out knew every word i was really impressed because i was like i'm a big mac miller fan there were definitely some deeper cuts that they played that i didn't know and even the songs i do know i don't know all the lyrics because it's rap i know like when i went to childish gambino i knew like every word of that but mac miller for some reason is like harder to memorize for me um Anyway, it was just nice to see like a group of people all there together. They somehow knew what a laser dome was. And um, so it's really special to me whenever I get to like introduce someone to the laser dome. It's like very intimate. Um, It's not something that I like let everyone in on because it's kind of like it is kind of vulnerable. It's like a vulnerable place to be. It's like you're lying there in the dark. You like put a blanket down. You lie down on the floor. It's like a movie theater if they took out like 40 seats in the middle and you got to lie down on the floor and look up. It's kind of like a movie and a concert had a baby because you can like sing along and clap and cheer. And I kind of want to dance a lot of the time. Um, but ultimately, like it's not a live performance. The music's not live, but like the design is live. So it's just like a really unique environment. I feel really proud that like the people in there know what it is because I'm like, this is such a cool ass thing. Um, And so it's very it's it's very much like a community. Like to me, it makes me feel less lonely that everyone just shows up there. We all know what to do. We all know why we like to go. It's like very special. Um, And so I agree with Kurt Vonnegut. I think it's like it makes me feel so much more tethered and attached to the place I live to like go to these things rather than like you can find community through standship standing. Like for example, the friend I was with yesterday, she met up, she met some of her closest friends by being on like one direction Twitter. And so it's not like all for naught. And there are like, you know, Taylor Swift nights at bars. So it's like there are, I'm not saying that there's, there's not, there's not no way to create community through celebrity, but I think local shows are amazing way to do that. Anyway, thank you, Kurt, for that. Getting back to the topic of like intimacy and eroticism, I think um, the laser dome to me is like a prime example of a way that I experience like, like, I don't know, I read this. um, I read this book, it was more of a compilation from Adrian Marie Brown. It was called Oh, it was it pleasure, pleasure activism. And it was talking about like eroticism. And a lot of it was about like, sex and masturbation and like that type of physical like you know just uh, <laughs> I was gonna say collusion uh, the the physical the physicality of it but there's a lot of other like for me like 
bike this is gonna sound you the thing is if you've never really like broken apart or impact eroticism this is my this might sound like perverted to you but like i think biking is very erotic like eroticism just means like intense pleasure and the laser dome makes me feel like i'm experiencing like a seventh sense like it's such a 4d experience it just lights me the hell up i used to describe it as romantic because it's like every time i go there i like want to make out with the person i'm there next to no matter like no matter like how much attraction i feel for them outside of that place it just like it's just a charged ass dome you know and that i thought was romantic but i'm like no i actually think the better descriptor for that would be erotic because it's not like i want to fall in love with the person next to me i just want to have this like pleasurable moment so laser dome can deliver all of that introspection and more that's what we do here at revelatorium we take something so ordinary and we 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 put the put the light on it and it becomes infraordinary what are the tiny little things that um light you up and the laser dome is one of those for me and um, if you ever visit i highly recommend it is super super special tldr have pillow talk with your friends make out with your friends like let's get a little bit more creative with our definitions of things that's in general one of my like life that's basically the way i move through the world i'm like how can we how can we get a little more creative with the definition of this thing and now that we're in the doorway of the revelatorium let's step through the threshold and really enter the room of revelation here topically i feel like we've already gotten pretty deep so let's just continue wading into that the Room of Revelation is actually a swimming pool. Um, <laughs> that would make cool cover art if I ever wanted to redesign it. Anyway, because I love... One thing I'm obsessed with is puddles. If you follow me on Instagram, somebody sent me like the sweetest DM. I wish I could pull it up, but basically it said like... Okay, I posted... I did pull it up. I posted it on my close friend story because I thought it was like too much of an egotistical thing to share on Maine. But I guess I'm sharing it with you, my 2,000 of my closest friends. Um, somebody said... They res- responded to my story of a cherry blossom tree blowing its petals in the wind. And I said it looked like rain the, of the non-water variety. And they said, I've learned to appreciate the small things in my surroundings from your stories and started to notice the environmental intricacies. When I walk around in my neighborhood, I can start to recognize which flowers bloomed today that weren't blooming a few days ago or the window kitties and their sleep schedules. Thank you, Kath Hart. And I was like... Okay, that is so special. I didn't even realize that was an outcome that was possible from an Instagram story is to inspire someone to live their life a little bit more romantically. But it's like, that is that is why I'm posting on my Instagram stories is because I'm like, look at all these little beautiful things that I want to save for later. I'm just always finding new ways that I want to influence people not to download mobile games, but to take photos of puddles. That's how I originally got on this point is that I really appreciate talking about swimming pools. I realized how much I appreciate. I just made a highlight on my Instagram stories for this. How much I appreciate the reflections in puddles. I'd never noticed this before I moved to Seattle, but that's why it's helpful to get out of your hometown and into a new place is that I didn't have in California. You don't have that many puddles. You do at times, but there's just not that much rain. There's so much more opportunity for puddles in Seattle, unsurprisingly. And puddles went on a clear day. Like when it's, whether it's actually, whether it's light or dark out, neon signs reflect off of puddles, trees reflect off of puddles, flowers reflect off of puddles. So I love like taking photos of those and getting to know where my favorite puddles are. That's one of my jokes I tell on stage for stand up is like, you know how in New York they say it takes like 10 years to be a New Yorker. Like, I don't know what point that is for Seattle, but I think it's when you discover you have a favorite puddle. Like, I'd never thought I'd get to this point, but it's like, I know where the flowers bloom in my neighborhood. I know where to pick the daffodils and the tulips and I know where the puddles are. And so, <laughs> and that's why I'm like, especially in the outfit I'm wearing, audio listeners, it's an embroidered vest. I feel like I'm strawberry shortcake. Like I do, I am kind of built like strawberry shortcake. Um, and that's not a bad way to be. Okay. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, while we're, while we're topically still, in the at least not maybe we've waded into the point of the pool where you have to like tread water a little bit i was watching let's let's prepare some nuance for this conversation okay that's what a podcast is about is if you're listening to me for this long you build up a little bit more context you still don't have the full context of who i am and where i'm coming from for this but let's just practice that good faith approach i was talking about a minute ago um 
with this. So I was watching Notes on a Scandal, which is this movie with Kate Blanchett and Dame Judi Dench. I did not realize that that actress was Dame Judi Dench. I just pictured her differently in my head. Anyway, um, in that movie, it's about basically um, it's notes on a scandal. So Kate Blanchett is a school teacher. This is in the synopsis, so I'm not spoiling anything. But she basically develops an inappropriate, illicit relationship with um, a student of hers. And so huge, huge, corrupt, um, morally bankrupt behavior. And another teacher, Dame Judi Dench, finds out and she asks her point blank, like, why did you do this? And I think this is like, especially I watched this before sort of like the Nickelodeon Quiet on Set series came out, which is an expose about all the grooming and child predation and like perversion that happens in the entertainment industry, the child entertainment industry. I watched this before that, but I think a missing link for me is like a lot of times these people, we, we, you know, we try child predators and we put them on the stand and we send them to prison. But I don't think we ever, we, we, we have these punitive measures and we lock them up, but it's like, why did they do these things in the first place? We never get to understand why someone would do like how do we prevent this that's my whole thing is like I feel like none of these documentaries or shows ever talk about how do we prevent this and like especially in the Colleen Ballinger onslaught of you know the toxic toxic gossip train or whatever the hell from like last year or was it the year before like all the videos were condemning her sure 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 right that app, app that 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 behavior should be condemned But nobody was talking about how do we prevent this? And I'm like, what is the how are we going to learn from this? What are the things that we need to flag? And like, it's it might seem obvious, but I'm like, this is happening on such a grand scale. And like, I'm someone where like, I've been groomed, not to the degree that like, Drake Bell has been or any of these people. But it's like, I have a very personal stake in it. And I'm like, I am like, I have come up against like groomers three times in my life have not been affected by all three of those but like it's very commonplace that these these people exist and I'm like how do we prevent this not how do we tell the victims to be better I'm saying how do we prevent people from ever getting to the point where they want to do these sorts of things and it's very taboo for some reason serial serial killers we have a bazillion tv shows and documentaries asking them why they did what they did and learning their psychology and sort of getting their villain origin story but like i want to understand how we prevent this type of like abuse from happening and in notes on a scandal it's a fictional from what i understand a fictional story but there's a scene where the other teacher asks her like why would you do this what how could you think to do this how could you justify it and what the character, what Kate Blanchett's character says, the line that she has is like, basically, I felt entitled to it. And that was not what I was expecting her to say. She said, I felt entitled to it because I've been like a goody two shoes my whole life, went through school, you know, married, had children. I'm a, I'm a mother and a teacher and I do everything right. And I've, I've been so responsible and I just felt like I, I was owed this. Like I should be able to like be reckless and do something bad. And I was like, that is like despicable and deplorable. But also that feels like that could be what someone would actually say is that they feel like they should be able to take this, 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 this risk and this like horrible thing because they've been so good. And I'm like, I know that like a lot of people don't think we should have these stories represented whatsoever for me. Like, I appreciate seeing them because, like, it resonates with me and it's, like, a story that, like, I have had experience with. So I just, like, wanted to – I wish I could ask some people, why did you do this? Because usually people just deny it and they don't think that what they're doing is wrong. But in this case, like, she knew it was wrong. And she's – I think a lot of people think that these people don't know it's wrong. Um, Some – I think sometimes – Sometimes they do, and sometimes they find disgusting ways to justify it. And this was a case where I was like, damn, like, it it, like worries me because I'm like, 
I think part of it is like, how do we stop the cycle of violence? Like Drake Bell is somebody who he was groomed and then he groomed someone else. And a lot of times is the case is like you perpetrate the the trauma that you've you've been through. And so it's like I am someone where I feel like I grew up a goody two shoes and was like walking the straight and narrow path. And now I'm being a little reckless and that like I quit my corporate job and like I'm not really saving right now. I'm not being super financially responsible. I'm still working. I have freelance gigs. I have income. I'm paying my bills, but I'm not doing like the most appropriate esteemed thing I could do at my age right now. Um, but I felt like I should do this because I I don't really go on benders and I don't do like I am pretty like like the thing is people always think that I have my shit together. People think that I am like so put together. And so I thought by doing this, it would make people see that like, oh, no, like she's bohemian and free spirited, too. But still, even now, people just read me. Maybe it's all the vests. People just read me as somebody who really is responsible and like I when I commit to things I follow through like in that sense I'm responsible like I feel like I'm a trustworthy loyal person um but I'm like I do not want to I do not want to cause the harm that has been caused to me and so many other people so whew, that was one sort of revelation I was thinking about um and um just thinking about like ri- like like for me um I've been thinking about just risk taking in general, apart from that movie. Let's 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 put that behind us. OK, thinking about risk taking somebody on my zine team had the question of who takes more risks, older siblings or younger siblings. And I put this question to you. So I have actually the data. I have the sample size of, you know, 50, 60 people and the data to say something about this. But for me, I'm like, as the younger sibling, I feel like I, I you would think the younger sibling would take more risks because the older sibling had to lock it down. Then you get to kind of like depart and be free. I feel like I took fewer risks because I saw all the ways that, you know, my older sibling struggled and my parents, you know, what, what my parents had to do to like support like her three years older than me. So when it came time for me to get to that point, I wanted to do everything right. And I didn't want to cause any like grief or struggle or anything. So that's like part of the reason why I like really stood like stood so straight instead of like doing things a little bit more like carelessly or not carelessly, but like, yeah, I just haven't been very risk taking because I wanted to basically please my parents and like not give them more labor. Um, And I really when I meet somebody else that has that like sort of like psychological motivation to them, I really understand them. When I meet a younger sibling that had like an older sibling that had like any type of like 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 learning disability or special needs or any type of like extra care they needed, like they were just a little bit more higher needs. I fucking get it. Um, and it, yeah, it like, it really affects the way that you move through the world. So I'm curious, I was curious to see what other people were going to say. And there's a lot to say on that. It's not necessarily as much of a revelation. Like a lot of my revelations this month are actually just questions that I have for you all. So let's, let's get into them. Another one of my questions is, would you rather laugh or make other people laugh? Because I've been reflecting on this. This month and many more, it took me a while to bring it to the pod, but I've been thinking about it for a while. A lot of these questions have been simmering and they just got to the boiling point. So we're pouring them into the teacup and we're sipping them. I obviously cannot shut the hell up about me doing comedy now. A really fun way to have a third place in your community, show up places every single week, have an outlet, get to express yourself, be in real fucking life instead of on TikTok. And um, so it's been valuable and wonderful. It's great to get out into your local arts and culture scene. It is. And you would think any comedian would say they prefer to make other people laugh. But actually, I think I like the experience of laughing more. Like I get more out of laughing than making other people laugh, oddly enough. So I'm like, should I be in this industry? Should I be in this lane if I don't feel that way? And I think it's I think it's fine. I still love to make other people laugh, but it doesn't like light me up inside the way that laughing like it is really important to me like the people that I am most enamored by are people that can make me laugh a lot like that's a really important 
trait or quality. And when I meet someone and they're relatively humorless, I'm like, I know it's not going to work. And for a while, I thought that was how everyone was moving through the world. I thought we all valued sense of humor above like everything else. Because whenever you're moving through the world, you just think that everyone else moves like you, but they don't. Um, And so I realized, no, a lot of people, sense of humor is like not really on their radar. They don't prioritize it within themselves. They're not like crafting that. And it was on the description for the comedy class I took last year to take it so that you could find other people that like have a passion for humor. And I was like, passion for humor? Doesn't everyone? Like, I was just like, I'd never thought of that as being like a hobby, like humor. I'm like, we all, that's how you make friends as you be funny together. Like, or do people have friend groups where none of them are laughing? Like, that was the, that was the whole goddamn point. So I find laughter to be such like a, it's such a pill. It's such a pill. It's such a pill. I need it. I need it. And it's like amazing to go to open mics because I know I'll have a lot of guaranteed laughter like two days a week. Um, so I asked you all that and we'll get, we'll get the scoop there too. Um, I also have been thinking about like art therapy and emotional regulation and hygiene. Because to me, laughter is very hygienic. It's like I need it to stay well. It's like a little like doing my daily journaling is very hygienic for me. Posting on my Instagram stories is hygienic. Like It's just like self-expression. I think when we think of hygiene, it's usually about like personal like cleanliness. But hygiene to me is anything that you need to do to feel like stable, regulated. And like for me, laughter is like that. Dancing is like that. Every single night in the bathroom mirror I have a speaker in there. If you don't have a speaker in your bathroom, like you don't, we don't live the same. (laughs) Like I have a speaker in like almost every room of my house. Like I'm always, and that's okay. Okay. I will acknowledge people with roommates. You are, you are absolved from this. You are marked safe from this allegation. Um, Because when I had roommates, I would have to listen to music in my AirPods And it actually decreased my quality of life a little bit not to be able to have a leisurely time in the bathroom where I can dance around because I'm a polite and respectful roommate. And I would try to do my stuff in the bathroom as quick as possible so I could get ready to bed, get ready for bed and get out of there. Because when I was in San Francisco, we had three people sharing one bathroom. And most places, you know, that I've lived, it's like that. This is my first time living alone. So I've never been able to like really spend time in the bathroom like this. (laughs) Spend sacred time in the bathroom. I also have a question about which places are sacred to you. And like for me, in front of the bathroom mirror, performing my little concerts every night to an audience of one, that's just for me. And that's also erotic. That's like erotic hygiene for me. It's like very pleasurable. It's like so fun to dance. Art, art therapy, self-expression, all of that wrapped into one. And especially on Thursday nights when New Music Friday comes out, it's so good. And also singings like that. I sing out loud once a day, at least, at least. There's so many times on the street where I want to be singing and I'll just whistle instead because I feel it's a little bit more socially acceptable. I still am pursuing social acceptability, I guess. When will I free myself of that? It's like important to be polite and cooperative in public, but it's like, why can't... I was walking last week And the person in front of me had their headphones on. They were singing You're So Vain out loud, loud enough and articulately enough and knew the lyrics well enough that I could recognize what song it was. And I did take a little video just for myself. It was of the back of her. So it's not like I'm doxing her or anything. And I did want to post it, but I was like, I don't have this person's permission. Even though she's not recognizable, her outfit was so loud that I was like, someone could know who this is. And I just like don't want to step into that. But I wanted to share it because I was like, I loved that this person was singing out loud. I just thought it was so encouraging and hopeful and wonderful. I never, I'm like rarely ever annoyed when someone's singing out loud in public. Um, And I was, I've been asking people, do you sing out loud once a day? And I ran a Twitter poll and it was like, no, I would not even, maybe it was like split down the middle. A lot of people don't sing once a day, which is fine. But I'm just like, I wonder what other types of hygiene you have. For yourself if you're not singing out loud once a day because that's such an important like piece of my own hygiene and I learned it because my mom would always sing out loud so I'm very used to like doing that but my sister doesn't I I don't even know what her singing voice really sounds like and isn't that so weird because she's literally my sister we lived in the same room for like 18 years like how do I not know what her singing voice sounds like but it is kind of intimate to hear someone's singing voice a lot of people don't like doing karaoke like I've 
always been um, very, um, yeah, outspoken, I guess, and like not shy. And I obviously like attention. I wouldn't be here right now if I didn't like attention. I have something I've also been thinking about is like the converse side of liking attention because I know that so well. I know that like I want attention because I suffer from benign neglect and I need to fill a little bit of a void or a hole in sort of like validation. I'm wondering about people that don't like attention so much that they like run from it. I'm like, is, is, is what's the root cause of that? Is that healthier? Is that more helpful to be like that? Is anyone just true neutral where they don't like attention? They don't dislike it. They just don't value it or think about it or like rate it or or think about it as they move through the world. Is that possible? Because I definitely like attention. So, but for me, it's like I'm not singing for attention because when I'm doing it at home alone, most of the time, no one can hear me. I'm not like recording myself. So it's, it's not even chiefly about attention, but I feel like the people that don't like to sing it's because they don't like attention like that would be I would assume the main motivation but maybe we need some of you to weigh in in the comment section if you're watching on YouTube Um, or even on Spotify there's a function to respond okay so moving on to the sacred place thing this was a question I was asking my friends on my birthday trip um, and also in our book club is like what is sacred to you and like what are sacred places and like one of my friends finds letters to be sacred I find like in terms of like symbols or like totems that are sacred to me like I love Coco Pelli who is like a spirit he has a beautiful outline to him he's like playing the saxophone and it's actually sort of like a spirit of like fertility but he's all he's a symbol all throughout the southwest and I've always felt a very special attachment to him I'm gendering him but like he he's got he they energy I would say Coco Pelli I gotta tweet that best part about Twitter nobody's on there anymore so I feel no sense of like performance I'm like I don't need to do numbers on here anymore three likes on Twitter is like 13,000 reblogs on Tumblr in the day like it's amazing on there right now I love it I love shit posting on there it's so important to have a shit posting outlet so many times my shit posting outlet has gotten real has gotten too real and Twitter never got too real like no one ever really found me over there and so I can live freely I can live freely. Twitter is not a sacred place. Twitter is not a sacred place. But I've been in, I've been enjoying. I actually didn't ask this question to you all because I forgot to put it on the form. But I just want you to ask that of your friends. And it's wonderful to know like wildflowers are very sacred to me. Bike rides are very sacred. Um, Alpine lakes are a sacred place to me. Um, it's nice to know about your friends. And then when you find those things, you can send them their way more. Like one of my friends holds balloons very sacred. So I love sending her photos of my of balloons when I see them. And then she posts them on her Instagram account devoted to the sacred treat of balloons. Okay. I also have a question that I've been mulling over, which is like, who from 10 years ago do you wish was still in your life and isn't? Because um, I read a book about regret a couple years ago. And one of the main categories of regret people have is people they've like lost touch with or fallen out of grace with. Like they just don't really have the same connection they did for whatever reason. Could be that they think the person's mad at them. Could be that just they drifted apart. And that's one of the only categories. If that person is still living and you have a way to contact them, that is one of the only categories of regret that you can address with action. Instead of just having to like get over it. It's like you can actually do something potentially to release the regret and the author detailed so many stories of people that did reach out and the other person received it really well I just had a friend do this with someone that they had a really tense sort of like disillusionment of their relationship and it worked out beautifully and it has for me on several occasions and there's somebody I'm vying to reconnect with right now that I've been thinking about and is the answer to my question someone that we had a really intimate friendship and um This person's just sort of like antisocial, like doesn't really keep up with anybody from college and also doesn't post on social media. So it's like it's literally dark. Like I have no idea what this person is up to. And I wonder if that makes me miss them and regret regret like losing touch more because I don't have any access to them. I think social media, when you do fall out of touch with people, you might not feel as strong of a longing to reach out because you feel like you still have an easy way to hear about their lives without having to be an active friend to them. 
And I don't necessarily think that's a good outcome of social media. I don't necessarily think that we deserve to have access to people's lives who we're not like really contributing to. Um, I know that might be a hot take and like a lot of people might d- disagree with it, but it's just like, I don't know. I feel like that's the reason I have a close friend stories. It's like, this is a privileged space for people that are putting in a lot of effort with me. I get to reveal more to you because we have a lot of trust built up because you're showing up for me. Like there's different expectations to this relationship and therefore you have different privileges to me. And I think that's a really fair way to go about your relationships. Like you shouldn't be giving all of yourself to everyone if they're not giving anything back, you know? Okay, finally, before we get out of the pool of revelations and onto a a lounge chair to dry off with some taking and leaving, um, the last sort of topic I've been thinking about is um, reactions and how, speaking of social media, comes up all the time because it's becoming more and more looming and large in our lives. Um, I think social media has uh, altered and sort of manipulated our sense of reaction our sense of fair reactions to something. Maybe I'm not couching this or posing this in the right way, but I recently had a couple of times where like a couple of times where my reaction to something did not compare with my expected reaction. Either I reacted much less sort of animatedly or like much, much less emotionally or dramatically, or I was way more upset or like, at an 11 with something I didn't expect to, you know, hit me so hard. And I was thinking about why it distresses me when my my, my reactions aren't in line with like my expectations. And I think part of the reason is that I have a strong expectation for reactions. And I don't think I should. I don't think there should be an expected, this is the way I'm supposed to react to this piece of information. But because of social media, a really popular like, content format is a super cut of people's reactions. Like I remember when I was in college, I would see videos or before I even went to college, I would see people that graduated before me post videos of them coming home from college early and surprising their parents because they didn't think that they were going to be home that day. And their mom or dad or, you know, sibling opening the door and like weeping and, and jumping for joy and they're hugging and like so exasperated. And I remember I did that several times coming home from college at least twice and I would get there I would punch in my home code I would come home like days early before anyone was expecting me and sometimes sometimes on a weekend where nobody was expecting me and I would walk in I would I would check with like my sister or something before I went home so I knew it was okay to be there I would walk in no one would be there so I'd like put my stuff down and then I would just sort of like walk into the living room and my dad would just be sitting there and he'd go, oh, hi. And I was like, what? <laughs> Where is the jumping and screaming and crying? And I don't know why I expected that. Those are different people. That's a different family. Why would that be the way that my family works? But I think I just wanted going back to the benign neglect and attention thing. I just wanted the attention that those people were getting. I was like, that attention looks great. Let me get some of that and do the same thing. No. It didn't pursue. It didn't produce the same result, and I therefore I felt like a failure. But it was like I still enjoyed the time with my family. I was just I, I wasn't like there was a little bit of like oh, do I mean less to you because you don't react that way? And I think that's a really uncharitable, maybe cruel. Maybe you can look at this and be like, wow, your parents don't love you. But like, I just feel like that'd be a cruel way to interpret the situation. It's just because their reaction like paled in comparison that they don't care about me as much. I'm like I feel like that's a horrible proxy in my mind, or maybe I just don't want to use that as a proxy because then it would just be hurtful to me. And why would I want to invite hurt? I'm not a masochist. Okay. Um, I did that several times and their reactions were never what I expected, but I had seen so much footage of people doing the same thing. And obviously people only post the ones where the reactions are, are entertaining. Okay. So that's really skewing our perception of reactions because we're only seeing the really compelling ones we're not seeing the ones where people are kind of like oh nice okay cool like whenever someone has like an engagement announcement they do a reel of like everyone facetiming everyone and showing them their ring and everyone like freaking the hell out it's like i haven't had that many friends get engaged but my reactions haven't been like i'm crying and screaming and shaking because i'm like oh i mean you're if you're on the relationship escalator that's the next floor that you get off on is engagement and like to me I'm like it's a different form of your relationship but I'm like oh good you guys are 
like I don't know I don't, I don't know I guess it just doesn't like because I'm not someone that like is really looking forward to marriage or like really really values it as like an accomplishment I'm happy for them but I'm like um I would be just as happy for you if you were you know boyfriend girlfriend and that that was it you know I'm like I'm I'm glad you're together this is meaning that you're going to be together probably more but it is no real guarantee of that because the divorce rate is like 50%. So I'm like, okay, cool. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being, I probably sound so cynical right now. And it's like, I am a romantic and I am like a lover girl, but it's like, I don't know. I just, I just like, I, for some reason, my reactions just don't live up to the expectation. And I always feel a little bit guilty when that happens. And I want to stop feeling that way. And I want to blame something and I'm going to blame social media. Because I don't think we should be seeing what the normal reactions are like. You should be able to react. I had no idea what the normal reaction to the laser dome should be. And that's kind of why it's such a mystical, magical place to me. Because it's like, it's not, it's not, people kind of know concert culture. Uh, I would argue they don't know it enough these days. Because we missed out in a few years and people forgot how to act. But Concert culture, like you're kind of initiated into it. You understand it's like in general, tall people stand at the back and like you you line up to, you know, go in. You don't just like cut people in line and, you know, you you clap when they come out. You don't talk too loud and you cheer. Don't push people like all these things are just kind of like unspoken, but you just learn them culturally. And I don't think we should ha- like I don't think we should have to set like like rigid rules. I think people should be free to express themselves in those spaces. But just think about how you're impacting other people and be cooperative and not distracting and like hurtful to the environment. But the laser dome people don't know how to act in there. It's like not a space where you have expectations of what the culture is like. So I really like showing people that like you're supposed to sing along in there and you're supposed to like clap because the person in the back that's doing it live like appreciates that feedback. It's like a concert. You want to cheer and you want to like give your reactions. That's the whole point of a live performance. If it's just the audience is silent and the performance performer is up there, it's like, well, what's the point? We could have just watched this from our TVs if you're not going to be like actually in the space and like reacting, you know? So um, I asked you guys if you had any reactions that uh, made you feel like you had there was a big delta. Okay, moving on from taking and leaving. I only have one leaving and it's jazz band dread. This is another thing that my, my precious 3000 Twitter followers know and nobody else does, but I have been taking a jazz band class for the last two and a half, three months. And I was very excited to have another musical outlet again. I've always been a musician. It's always been a title I've held. For basically the entire time I was a student, I was also a musician. So it's like that was something when I graduated college that I had to part ways with at the same time. Like it might seem a little bit ridiculous to be like, oh, you have to mourn the title of student. But like it is a transition to go from your identity being so attached to saying you're a student and you're in school to then, you know, going into the working world or like having a different field that you're in. And I also kind of like at the same exact time, I didn't realize, but I dropped being a band kid when I graduated college and I left the marching band because I didn't have a, like a outlet to play in in the Bay Area that I really wanted to. Um, and I've missed that. I've missed being around band kids. I miss their sense of humor chiefly. Sorry, most important, most, most importantly. And um, so I joined this jazz band. I got an amazing scholarship. I was so happy about it. And unfortunately, I dreaded going every single Sunday night. I didn't want to go. I didn't I didn't find my people there. It wasn't the right environment. It wasn't laid back and casual enough for me. <laughs> Which you might be saying, well, it's a class you sign up for and pay for. Of course, it's going to be like structured and formal. But I'm like, I'm just used to jazz band being a bunch of like freaks and geeks and stoners. And everyone here was very buttoned up and like professional and like serious. And I was just like, oh, that's not really what I want. I just want like a place where we can kind of like shoot the shit, have some fun, make some music together. That's what I'm used to. And so I didn't quit. I followed through. I wanted to a lot, but had our performance. I actually loved performing on stage again. That was so fun, but will not be continuing. And I can finally leave behind the dread. It feels ridiculous to have dread around a hobby that you do. It feels ridiculous. I felt so conflicting and like paradoxical about about it i was just like how is this happening so thank god good riddance (laughs) 
It's unfortunate, though. If you know any musical environments in Seattle to play in that are like fun and casual and a trumpet player would be accepted, let me know. All right. Taking wise, um, I will be taking E letters this month. I have been writing letters to a few of my friends and sending them over email. We go back and forth and it's a long form way to keep up with each other and hear about everything that's on our minds and what we're going through and our transformations and transitions and all of that. And you get to a level of a level of depth that you don't with just like exchanging text messages. And I was inspired by Rachel Nguyen. That's chic on YouTube. I love that's someone who she she really influences my life philosophy and the way that she approaches the world because she literally tweeted a screenshot of part of an email that she had sent like an e-letter with her and her friend and kind of advocated for doing this. And within 15 minutes, I had posted it on my close friend story and was like, who wants to do this? Who wants to do this with me? That's my favorite kind of influencer to follow. The ones that are like, here's how to approach the world, not here's what to buy, or here's how to maximize or optimize. It's like, here's a beautiful way that you can approach the world. So there's that. Um, I also want to take more co-working I need the structure of someone being there with me to kind of encourage me to get work done. I like think that it can be difficult to co-work with a friend if you haven't seen them in a while because you just do want to talk. But if it's someone you're seeing enough, you can see them hang out and then another day do some co-working. And actually, that's where I'll be going after this is to edit this podcast on a rooftop deck overlooking the lake and the skyline with a friend, because I live a magical, paradisical, paradisical. What's the what's the adjective for paradise? Paradisial? I don't fucking know. Anyway, so excited for that. I have like a great day ahead. It's been a great weekend. I'm feeling up and I'm off of my Wellbutrin rations that I've been on for the last few months. So I've been worried about relapsing into my depression, but I have not been feeling mentally ill lately. And that's amazing to say because I did not think I'd be this bounced back. When I first, at the end of last summer, I was, I had really taken a, taken a beating emotionally and was in the, was in, was not in, was not swimming well. I was barely keeping my head above water. And now I'm like, wow, it's, uh, it's nice when I'm not stuck in like thought spirals. I, there's still moments of that, but I'm feeling really, really good. Um, okay, finally, taking emotional availability from other people. I'm taking it. I'm stealing it. I'm snatching it. No, I think this is something that is like subtly picked up on by me is like the emotional availability of other people. Some people are just more sort of like reserved in that respect. But the reason I like these e-letters is because it takes a very emotionally available person to share something with you in that long form way. And not everybody has reached a level of comfort within themselves to do that. And so I really, really, really like pursuing and seeking relationships with very emotionally available people. I feel like that's a trait that we only ever really talk about in the dating realm. But again, in my very asexual way of approaching the world, I prefer not I prefer but most of the time, since I'm not in any sort of like romantic entanglement right now, besides with the world and the way that it glows, Besides with the lakes and the and the valleys and the rivers and the forests, um, no, I'm not in any romantic entanglements. So my friendships, I'm like, oh, emotional availability and friendships is so important too. Let's talk about that. And I just did. So now let's let's close her out with your March confessions. What do we have for taking into April? What's coming into the next month with us? Okay. And we have from a frequent respondent, Quirked Up Shoddy, writing in from the hands of corporate America, endearingly, who's 27. She said she's taking a new intergenerational friendship. I'm circling back to January's Revelatorium, where the podcast discussed our parents' friends. I was surprised to see how many viewers were impartial to their parents' friends, because one of my 2024 goals was to befriend a specific friend of my mom's. She is deeply spiritual, as am I. And I don't have many people in my life to discuss the depth of my spirituality with. I took her out to coffee on a sunny afternoon, and we had such a deep and enriching few hours together, discussing a plethora of subjects regarding the deeper nuances of the human condition. I felt so much love and light from her, and I know she did too, to the point where she, as a true empath, got emotional when we departed. 
I know how much it meant to my mom, and we both got a little emotional during the debrief too. My new friend and I bear a 35 years difference, and initiating quality time with her closes out my last goal that I had entering 2024 as well. Amazing, stunning, like applause all around. I am so happy that you were able to make good on this. And this like is what I'm talking about. It's so important to be around emotionally available people that are willing to get into the weeds with you about spirituality, especially it's like really special to have that type of intimacy. That's that's an intimacy with someone like spiritual intimacy to talk about those types of things. A lot of people are very shut off to that side of themselves. That's why I really actually value. (laughs) It's so funny. Like somebody picked up the artist way. Oh, that was who I was thinking of. I influenced I influenced somebody to pick up the artist way. And I'm like, I'm happy to do that. There's also this clip on Caleb Heeren's podcast with Brittany Broski. Was it Brittany Broski? Maybe it was Drew Off Wallow. Anyway, he was saying that like when someone's really down bad, you'll know because they'll have a, a copy of The Artist Way. And he was like, if they are reading The Artist Way, you need to get them shoes without laces, which I don't fully understand that joke. But I'm like, yeah, uh, The Artist Way, when someone's reading that, they're about to go through a, a transformation of sorts. Um so I don't mind this, maybe some of the stigma that it has. I don't care. I don't care because it's brought me so much good. So it doesn't matter. But anyway, somebody picked that up because of the amount of times I freaking mention it in this podcast because that's how influential it is to me in my life philosophy. Um, but that's why I like having my Artist Way book club because it's an opportunity to talk about spirituality. And I was able to talk about my own spirituality this week because I went on an artist date to see the Compline Choir here in Seattle at a really historic landmark church. Um, And so it's basically a a men's choir. They sing for 30 minutes every Sunday night. And all all the coquette girls pulled up. People were lying on blankets on the floor like it was the laser dome, but it was like a religious choir singing about heaven and hell. Um, And it was very mystical and cool because they were so perfectly pitched and that space is vacuous and so it echoes in a beautiful way the reverb is amazing the contents of what they were singing about i was like spiritually i don't align with this uh as an agnostic person don't appreciate the punitive version of god where he's punishing i'm just like i don't know why you'd want to believe in a punishing god why is that helpful why is that helpful um my god is an awesome god supportive um so yeah it's special when you're able to really talk i was like who do i talk about i had a really amazing experience and it's like who do I talk about this with that I know that would like get it and so it's important to have those people I'm glad you found them another Bay Area respondent Olivia who's 23 said finally being able to complain about a difficult work person because I've become friends with a coworker. truly life-changing to complain to someone who also suffers this person's annoyance also evening hikes because the sun is still out after work see again so important to have a platform for these conversations It's so important when people don't have people to talk about these things with, they go to the internet and they might start amazing, beautiful conversations that welcome people in, or they could go on a snark page and just use, use their outspokenness for evil. (laughs) So having, having this, having a work wife, work husband is so important. Work, work spouse. Lauren, who's 21 in her cozy bed being warmed by my ever faithful heating, heating pad said she's taking a continuation of romantic feelings developing for my bestie, who is more than a friend, but still less than a lover. But this month, I have clarity that she feels it too. I read this so giddy. I was like, oh, like requited love. What's better than that? What is better than that? It's like so it's such a risk to tell someone how you feel and confess your feelings for them. This is what this forum is for. I'm like, I want to hear your confessions. I want to hear what you've been what you've been up to. And it's like, so worth taking that risk because the only way you're going to know if they feel the same way is to go out on that ledge. I'm so happy for you. Helen wrote in and said, they're taking my boyfriend. Last month, I wanted to leave not talking to the guy I'm dating about what's going on between us. And I did. If you remember, this person wrote in and I included them last month and they were like wanting to have a conversation about, they wanted to have a what are we conversation. And so we got the, we got the results and they're in. The talks were slightly awkward, which was 100% my fault. He was great and actually did most of the talking once I brought up the the topic. But we're officially together now, and I'm so happy with how the situation turned out. Yes! Again, taking the risk is worth it. Like, 
I'm so glad this was like the, the outcome. All right. We have Alicia, who's 23 in Los Angeles. They're taking Instagram because I deleted it for Lent and I shall be making my triumphant return on March 30th. Deleting it wasn't really life-changing, but it's nice to know that I am capable of being off of it for six weeks. It, okay, you know, I get it. Lent, that is an important exercise. I think like doing a sober month from anything you're engaged in really helps you analyze the relationship you have with it. And even if you feel like you can't take a month off and you don't want to do it, that tells you a lot too. It's like, if you don't feel like you can take a month off from something in your life, what is the role that it serves in your life? Is it supportive or is it restrictive? Um, Love to take little breaks from social media. Doing it, I didn't realize Lent was six weeks. That's a long time, actually. That's 75 hard, basically. The Catholics invented 75 hard. 75 hard is Catholic pilled. Why aren't the coquette girls doing that? Um, I'm doing a 75 hard for not checking up on my ex crush on social media and I'm 50 days in and I'm over the moon. I feel so accomplished. It's so hard to stop checking up on somebody. I have done it for like almost everybody I've ever had a crush on. Like I get to a point where it slows to like I check up on them. I remember to check up on them like once a year, but there was nobody that I was like really hung up on checking them all the time. But he's like so active on social media. It's ne- I've never had a crush on somebody who is so online and so so productive in content that I was like, oh damn, this is gonna be the the biggest boss. This is my final boss, and I I am 25 days from beating it. So in a way, I'm also participating in Lent. Krista, who's 29 in Seattle, is taking my brand new e bike. My boyfriend and I are loving ripping around Seattle on the bike trails and are enjoying how bike friendly the city is. So many adventures to be had this summer together and I'm living for it. I am so pro bike, but we need to talk about bike politics for a second because I'm coming to a point of clarity and um, interconnectivity where I understand there's a lot that gets in the way of people feeling safe and bike prone. One of them is just like most of our cities have really bad bike infrastructure I'm very privileged to live in a city that has amazing bike trails, like hundreds of miles of bike trails where you're not going to be hit by a car. There's a few intersections with cars on the bike trail, but like the actual trail itself is protected and there's nobody else but like bikers, skateboarders, walkers, runners on it. And it's euphoric. It's the best. It's paradise. So I'm like so happy that this person discovered it. Um, And also not everybody grew up on a bike. I was, again, I I grew up in a freaking burly. And if you know what that is, you know my culture. That's also probably why I have scoliosis because I was hunched in the back of that thing bumping around. But it's like, I've always been used to that type of motion and I biked myself to school every day from second grade to 12th grade. So it's like, it's second nature to me. I'm, I'm hearing of some people that have been taking adult bike classes and I'm very much in support because the independence that having a bike can give you as a carless person is amazing. There's places here that are faster for me to take my bike than to drive. Um, but I also, I'm like, I need, I, I feel like I'm a, a big bike evangelist, a bike propagandist, but I haven't always acknowledged the, like the other forces at work that might prevent you from jumping on a bike as easily as I do. And actually pairing with that, the same person said in terms of what she's leaving, She is parting with her Subaru Outback upon moving to Seattle. It is the first car that ever fully belonged to me and felt like a big step towards independence since leaving a really bad relationship. At first, I was really upset at the thought of letting it go, but I'm learning a lot about the relationship between freedom and possessions from this experience. And I love hearing people go carless. It does not not surprise me that you went carless and immediately got a bike because that's like... I was always going to get a bike here, but it became especially valuable that I had one when I totaled my car. I was, I became carless, not by choice, but by force. Um, But I was getting, I was going to get a lease on a car. And it feels weird that I'm talking about my, my car status as like a part of my identity. But weirdly enough, being a pedestrian has become like a core trait of mine. Like, cause I have a lot of pedestrian friends, not in that they're simple minded and they do basic stuff. I'm saying like, I have a handful of carless friends here. Like San Francisco, most people were carless. New York City, most people are carless. Seattle is sort of like mixed. There's definitely some people here that would be shocked if you didn't have a car and would be like, how do you live? But it's like, when you don't have a car, you find ways to live on your two feet. Okay. Like 
it it people with people sometimes people with cars don't have as much imagination around pedestrianism because they've never tried it so it's amazing that you're trying it by your own volition i think that's incredible and there are values for cars such as you know going out onto hiking trails and whatnot but there's a bus line that takes you there in the summer here um and also other people usually give me rides and also you can rent cars for much cheaper than paying the lease and everything i was yeah so i was gonna get another car and then the lease was so expensive i was like it's not worth it and now part of the reason that i can live more frugally and afford to have odd jobs like i do right now is because i don't have a car payment i don't have car insurance i'm not paying for gas not paying for maintenance all of that really adds up okay Paul, who's 28 in Spain, said he's leaving in March, an all-consuming jealousy about a friend I have a huge, unrequited, and unrequitable crush on. I'm wondering why it's unrequitable, if it's just like they're in a relationship. But um, I also wanted to take the, the, the taking part of his response, which was the knowledge that said friend, the knowledge that said friend actually loves and cares for me platonically, and that this friendship, as it is, is already infinitely enriching for my life. And this to me is my mindset around like having a crush on somebody. Not everyone that you have a crush on, you have a friendship with. But that is like, that is why I don't understand when someone has a crush on me and I don't have a crush on them back, why they're not interested in pursuing a friendship. It's like, don't you want to have some sort of connection to me? Why does it, why is romantic the only one on the table? You know, some, some, maybe some people genuinely only would feel romantic attraction towards me, not any platonic or intellectual or emotional. But I'm like, if I'm feeling romantic attraction towards someone, it's because I have emotional, intellectual attraction to them probably as well. So even without the romantic part, I'm like, there's still an intimacy and a connection we can share here. So I love the way that you put this because, you know, I've had little crushes on friends and it's scary because revealing your feelings, you feel like you could bust up a friendship and sometimes that does happen, but a lot of times it's like, no matter what they say, I know they still care about me. It's not like this person's going to reject me and in totality, it's like they might just reject the romantic part, but like they definitely still want to be around me. That's undeniable. Anonymous, who's 27 in the UK, is leaving my late teenage simulation, Irresponsible Adventures. I really let go this month a bit too enthusiastically. This is what I'm talking about. It's like when you restrict yourself and you're really disciplined, there's times where you just want to go on a bender. Um, and again, <laughs> before you even say, I'm not talking about notes on a scandal, I'm not saying that type of bender, okay? That's not a bender, that's a crime. Um, I'm talking about like, you know, you just want to be a little reckless for me. It's like, I, I put it into my latest YouTube video. Go watch it. I'm really proud of how it turned out. I have a new series on YouTube. It's about confessionals closing out my 20s before I turn 30. Um, and I'll let my room get messy. I'll let my dishes pile up. I'll let my hair get dirty if it means I'm like having a lot of fun with my friends and like, you know, having little adventures. So I think, you know what? It happens. You'll get back on the horse, you know, just don't get too stuck in it. Ashley, who's 23 in New York, is leaving behind Googling and Redditing every thought that enters my mind. I feel like it would be better for my well-being to sit with my problems or questions instead of having instant access to answers and solutions. Similarly, I'm leaving behind scrolling Reddit, reading about hundreds of problems I don't have of people I don't know. It's information overload and it creates a cycle of what if anxiety for me. So um, first, there's a second part of this answer, but this is what I'm talking about with celebrity culture and community. Sometimes we know too much. Also with reactions, reaction supercuts. Sometimes we know too much about other people we're not meant to know about. It's like 30 years ago, like our brains psychologically were not set up to like know that much information. Usually in the olden days, it's like unless you went to a show and you heard someone talking about something on stage or you had a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with somebody, you would not know random little tidbits about how they're doing and what's going on, you know? And so it's like, oh, uh, sometimes it doesn't feel right. It does feel overwhelming and sort of like it's not meant to be. So appreciate that. Second, I'm leaving behind self-help content. I feel like I have spent so much time overanalyzing my issues that I've actually became a worse person because I'm no longer living in the moment and instead I'm overdosing on how I can always be doing better in some act aspect of my life instead of just living life. And I do think we need to talk about this because... um. 
I feel like I definitely promote some vein of like self-help content. I don't really know. Like I don't think of myself as like a self-help YouTuber. I think I used to be when I would make how to be productive in college and eight study tips and how to get straight A's like that felt felt very much like productivity, self-help, like self-optimization YouTuber. I've tried to step away from that because I myself am trying to dismantle my own relationship with like perfectionism and like performance in that way. But I think a lot of people don't like The Artist Way because it is like a self-help book. I feel like it's, I feel like it's, it's a recovery book. I'm like, is recovery self-help? I guess. But I'm like, if someone told me they went to like a treatment program for an addiction, I wouldn't be like, oh, that's self-help. Because it's not. Other people are helping you. <laughs> anyway, um, I I don't know. I uh, I have it's. I have a complicated relationship with self help too, and I think it's easy. It's easy to let it take over in terms of like, like over identifying with what is wrong with you, and literally that. Um, literally that Jemima Kirk meme where she's like, I think you guys are thinking about yourselves too much. That stays with me. She's very wise. Jemima Kirk has a lot of wisdom. Unfortunately, Jessa in that show did have wisdom, too. Just now kind of putting that together. Anyway, sometimes it is just like you're actually too focused on yourself and you need to get outside of yourself. So like everything, it takes careful balance. But I'm glad that you've found what you need to sort of change. Ashley, who's 29 in Philadelphia, said she's leaving, trying to control the outcome to situations. I went out on a few dates with a guy and rejected him only because I suspected he would reject me first. I wish I would have sat with my discomfort and allowed him to make his own decision. I'm committed to being authentic to my feelings, even if it hurts. We are built different, Ashley, because I I don't think I've ever rejected someone preemptively. I'm the kind of person who it's like, I'll stay to the bitter end with my jazz band thing. I should have rejected it day one when I felt like it wasn't aligned, but I stuck with it. And then I was like, I can't give up because I have a scholarship and they're counting on me on the performance and I don't want to leave a hole in the fourth trumpet part. Um, So I just stayed till the bitter end and then cut the cut the cord. I'm wondering what would have happened if you hadn't rejected him. Sometimes for me, I make up these little stories in my head and then I talk to the person. They're like, no, that's not at all what I was thinking. Like, I think I'm actually pretty bad at like guessing what other what's what other people are feeling or thinking and that's why it's so important to me to just express what I'm feeling to them and get to a point of trust and intimacy that we can do that because I'm like I'm not going to be able to read your mind okay now I did just want to share the statistical results to the laugh poll of whether you prefer to make others laugh or laugh yourself and at the time of polling we got new results but at the time of polling when I collected the results um, there were some that were in the middle, so I couldn't include them. But we had in the camp in the camp of laugh, they prefer to laugh themselves. We had 17. In the camp of making other others laugh, we had 23. So it did, it was somewhat split, but like people in general prefer to make other people laugh. And it was interesting. A lot of people felt like preferring to laugh meant that they were selfish in some way. Like this person from the Chicago suburbs said, selfishly, I prefer to laugh than make others laugh, mostly because I'm not good at it. And I just had never thought about laughter as selfish. I was like, I don't think laughing can be selfish. Like, I just don't think that I I don't know. In some ways, I feel like you could you could make a case for either one of those being selfish, but I don't think you need to make the case. Put the case down. But I loved the responses. I can't wait to, to share some of these with you because the justifications made so much sense. Like for this this answer saying that they like to laugh more than make others laugh, it was because they're not good at it. It's like they're not good. Some people responded that they would prefer to make others laugh because they're not able to do it much. So it makes them feel better. It's like what you're lacking when you get that makes you feel better than something that you're more used to. You know, Blen, who's 23 in Boston, said she prefers to laugh. And I'm known amongst my friends and sisters to laugh very easily. So this is a case where it's like something that does come easily to you, you prefer. My favorite people to make laugh are actually the ones that are a hard laugh. <laughs> I love to really go for the gold, you know, really set the difficulty level high. But it's like though when I can make someone who I consider to have like a really good taste in humor, like a really good sense of humor, if I can make them laugh, it makes me feel like, oh, damn, I'm so glad they thought I was funny. 
Um, I have some friends who are very easy laughers and their laughs are amazing, but it doesn't really stroke my ego because I'm just like, oh, it's more about them than it is about me. Like, I didn't really do much here. They're just like an easy laugh. They just That's just the way they live. And I'm just I'm just absorbing it. Claire in Fort Collins at 21 said, as much as making others laugh gives me a much appreciated ego stroke, I think I could go days without making someone else laugh, but I couldn't bear a day without laughing. Exactly. And in this case, it's like, yeah, there's some people are saying the ego stroke. Well, okay, yeah, some people are saying they feel egotistical for laughing. And some people feel like it's an ego stroke to make other people laugh. And I would say in general, I'm surprised I don't feel a bigger ego stroke from this. I'm like, why do I like to make people laugh? Like, I haven't really like analyzed that before. And again, it's like, I think you guys are thinking about yourselves too much. Sometimes it's just nice to think about the the motivations and origins for things. It's like, I can think about this or I can clog my brain with TikTok. Which one? Which one? There's two options. All you can do is introspect or go on TikTok these days. And I prefer to introspect, but sometimes TikTok wins out and it's too bad. I feel like I like to make other people laugh because it's like a fun exercise for me of like self-expression. Like it just feels like a nice little way to get my yayas out, you know? Like, I feel like I get a lot out of making other people laugh just as like a little mental exercise because you it you have to being clever is so fun. It's so fun to be clever. Now I'm going to read to you a short essay that Quirked Up Shoddy in the Hands of Corporate America wrote in about this question. And she said, look, Kath, I have an ego, an ego fueled upon how witty and funny I am. I'm going to be the kid that raises their hand too much in class to say that on behalf of those who are too shy to speak up this time. I can make an entrance to a room by extracting the undertones, setting the stage with the group's uncommon denominator, with a sprinkle of callbacks to past experiences as applicable. This magic that I exude creates a painful existence, high up in my ivory tower, spreading laughter without receiving much of the upper echelon of highbrow humor that I practically practically sweat subconsciously at this point. I imagine that this is what it must feel like to be a genius, a savant of sorts, to be so funny that only a handful of people in my life can return the jests, lest at my frequency. To answer your question, our benevolent and fellow humorist, Catherine, it is not a preference, but a state of being that I must acknowledge head on with this prompt, a blessing and a curse. And the meta thing about this response is if you don't have this sense of humor, you might think this person's being serious. I don't know this person. I just know them through their responses to my revelatorium forms. And I can tell that this is like, this is in jest. Like this is said tongue in cheek. But I'm like, if someone took this seriously, it would be, that would, I'm like, no, this, so many people don't have good like humor comprehension. They're not good. Kira Sullivan, who I follow on TikTok, she tweeted something about sex in the city and it was completely misconstrued and people didn't understand it. And she made a TikTok saying that like people would rather think a woman is stupid before thinking that what she was saying was in an attempt to be funny. Like it was, it was a funny thing. And that is so true. I always worry about being misunderstood. And like I posted this stupid caption on my Instagram for my latest photo with the cherry blossoms saying like such a beautiful way to celebrate for truck month. Because obviously cherry blossom trees, they're not there to celebrate for truck month. It's a fucking joke. And I thought everyone would get that. To me, it's like so obvious that that's a joke. But then my dad DMs me and says, my Uncle Steve asked if I work for Ford now. And I'm like, no, Uncle Steve, I don't work for Ford now. I feel like a lot of my jokes don't land. Uh, I'm doing little bits that people don't know are bits. And that's always really really unfortunate that's kind of why i didn't like jazz band because no one really got my sense of humor it's like a big deal to me that people understand my sense of humor to understand me and for me to feel safe and like protected and trusted around you i need to know that when i make a joke you're not going to judge me you're going to know that i'm making a joke because if you take what i'm saying at face value 100 percent seriously it's not going to look good it's like no this is a joke this person is kidding they're not saying that they're actually a genius okay but it, there there is still truth to this if you were to take it 100% as a joke, that would be too far too. This this is somewhat truthful. It's like, yeah, sometimes when you have, when you are really intellectual, okay, you're going to feel misunderstood and people aren't going to get your sense of humor. And that's a very lonely thing. That's a very lonely thing. Okay, Hannah, who's 21, that's writing in from my couch that I've almost constantly been doing homework on, said she prefers to laugh. I don't like to be the center of attention, but I do love a laugh. And that's why I'm like, I what 
it's the benign neglect in me that makes me not so I feel like it's very common for people to be like I don't want to have a wedding I don't want to be sung happy birthday to I don't like being the center of attention and I'm like where are you guys getting that from I know what the origin of wanting attention is what's the origin of not wanting attention that part of it I need to have another person on another podcast who doesn't like attention which will never happen because to like we don't hear from people who don't like attention because they don't let us give them our attention that's a problem I want to hear from you guys So if someone wants to inform me of how you got to be like that, let me know. Okay, on the topic of reactions and not reacting strong enough, there actually weren't a lot of examples of this. Maybe it's hard to think, but Anonymous, who's 26, lying down in bed, said, this is not an event, but most recently when I watched Poor Things, I expected to like it a lot because a lot of people love it and a lot of my friends liked it, but I responded quite differently and I was surprised that I actually didn't really love it and had very mixed feelings about the politics in the movie when everyone else seemed to think it was a super feminist movie. And personally for me, although the movie was made by a man and I think you could just write it off completely as incapable of being feminist, I do think men can be feminists, shocker. I do think that they can. And I don't think that for me, I understood that movie to be the experience of growing up a woman and thinking that the world is your oyster and then realizing there's all these limitations and there's all these opportunities where you're going to be sexualized and you're seeing the the, unfor- the misfortune and suffering of other people and you can't do anything about it because of the limitations that you like. I got that movie. I understood there was also a very strong sense of humor in it. And if you took it 100% seriously, I think it would be doing it a misfortune, misdeed. I don't think you're saying that you did do that. I think it's very possible to actually just have a different political reaction to it and just like not agree with it. Um, But I think this is a very common, common experience right now. And also something I saw is that a lot of people are reading reactions to things before they go and consume them. Versus typically, you know, you go see a new play, a new movie, a new show, you go to experience it with your open mind, and then you're able to maybe read the reviews afterwards. But a lot of times I too, I'm getting filtered in opinions, and those are affecting me before I'm able to make my own judgments. And so in this case, maybe you would have responded to it differently if you hadn't heard so many people support it, because I saw it pretty early on, I only heard one person support it when I went to see it. Um, and I think like Saltburn was another example of that, like a very evocative. These are very evocative films. And so if it doesn't evoke the same things that other people it evoked from other people, it's going to be an issue. Anonymous in Chattanooga, Tennessee, who's 33, said the most acute example would be when the government said the pandemic was over while it continues to rage and people being relieved while I was heartbroken and terrified, not only made worse because people I loved believed and were relieved, but mostly because of that. Yes, it is always telling when someone is speaking like COVID no longer exists. Like when COVID was happening, it's like, oh, you know, people are getting sick every day like this is still like when people think it's just like done i'm like no the flu's not done you know hpv's not done all these things people are still contracting you know we're in we're in the epidemic stage of it or it's endemic not epidemic but it's endemic i mean is it even endemic i don't even know the correct terminology for it at this point but it's still active okay i know this episode's a long end but we got some good write-ins i need to read this response from Charlotte, who's 25, in Aurora, Colorado, in in terms of a a reaction that didn't live up. So, somewhat recently, I was having a conversation with a friend when she told me that a new neighbor informally invited her over for coffee. My initial reaction was along the lines of, how kind, you should totally go. But my friend expressed some hesitation on the basis that the person may be homophobic because she's Catholic. She felt like the best course of action would be to drop in conversation that something would be to drop in conversation something that tells of her queerness, such as using her partner's pronouns, they are a lesbian couple, in conversation. My reaction to this was one of skepticism. As a queer person myself and someone who was raised Catholic and attended homophobic Catholic schools, I wouldn't do that. I told my friend that I didn't think it was necessary. This surprised me for two reasons. One, I'm extremely introverted and have a lot of sympathy for people who don't accept social invitations for whatever reasons. And two, I strongly believe that queer people and other marginalized and minoritized groups have every right to be wary about people they don't know, especially those who may not share their experiences. 
This brief conversation made me really think about how much I view my own queerness as a more private matter that I don't feel the need to disclose to everyone, especially when I'm getting to know someone. Having this thought after this conversation has really taken me aback. Is this internalized homophobia or do my views diverge from many other queer people on this topic? I don't believe that disclosing information about one's sexual orientation is necessarily a means of combating systemic oppression, which is not to say that people are not discouraged from living as their full queer embodied selves. I've never been in a romantic partnership and I am very femme presenting. So my queerness is really a topic of conversation with people who aren't queer in some way. I've also recently come to a realization that I am probably on the ace spectrum, and this isn't something I want to disclose off the bat because the queer community is already hypersexualized, not by its own fault. I think I long to get to know people without having to necessarily disclose any information about my queerness, and I perhaps projected this onto my friend by encouraging her to get together with her neighbor without first disclosing anything about her sexual orientation. I feel surprised that after years of being out and proud, I find myself wanting to become more private about queerness, and I can't figure out if that means I'm more comfortable with it or experiencing a bout of internalized homophobia in my mid-20s. Oh my god. This made me feel so read and seen. I'm so glad. Like, these are the types of feelings that are worth confessing because somebody out there feels the same fucking way. And I don't think you're doing any harm by expressing this. This is like something that I talked about during my vlogmas was like my own experience with like identity and sexuality. And I've had this conversation with several trusted friends about like the state of like queer culture if I'm even allowed to make any claims about it, because I'll just take one piece of this, was which was when you're talking about feeling like you're on the ace spectrum and something you don't even want to disclose really because the queer community is hypersexualized. And I feel like that, may, I am very timid about just like being like, I'm low-key asexual. There's an, I have an asexual way about me. <laughs> it's like the closest I get. I'm like, there's, I, I'm, I have an asexual way about me. Seattle is a very queer city, and I so I think if people were to analyze my sexual experiences as an indictment of my sexuality, it might not be accurate because asexual people, it's like, well, my attraction to someone might not look the same as your attraction to somebody. But does that mean that I'm still attracted to that gender if I'm not attracted to them in the way that you're attracted to them? That's why it's fucking confusing to be asexual because it's like, even if you're like, Even if you're like an asexual lesbian, it's like your attraction to women might look different than another lesbian who is allosexual, who experiences sexual attraction, their attraction to a woman. So it's like, am I gay in the same way that you're gay? If I don't want to have sex with women, does that make me less gay? Like, it's really confusing. It's like really genuinely so confusing. It just doesn't feel like you can be as determined about your sexuality when you don't have the sexual expression of it that's like what we're taught to be like well if you want to have sex with that gender then you're attracted to that gender but it's like what if i don't am i still attracted to that gender huge question mark so um yeah ultimately i don't feel like i owe anyone an explanation of my sexuality i feel like i've gotten that to a point where like i'm my sexuality is fluid it's changing a lot. There's not one label I want to put in my bio that I think is going to like, you know, maintain a good position of people to understand me. It's something that is nuanced and complex, and it takes a good amount of trust for me to really open up to somebody about it. So I don't feel like I owe it to a stranger. And I don't feel like I should, someone should make me feel like I do owe it to a stranger. I feel like I've had, there's been times where I've tried to explain my sexuality to somebody off the bat, and it doesn't come out right. It doesn't, I'm not portraying it the right way. And then we get to know each other better and they start to learn more about me and they go, oh, it clicked now. I understand what you're talking about. I just know that it's like more worth it for me to not write off. And so, but then it's like people really are, we're at a point with identity where your sexuality is a really important like identity marker for some people where they really want to know. But I'm like, if we're getting along without you knowing what my sexuality is, Okay, this is where it does get complicated because it's like, what if this neighbor were homophobic and you're getting along because they don't know that you're homophobic, but hom- like homosexual, and the second that they know it, you're gay, then they wouldn't get along with you anymore. That's a fucking problem. I'm talking about like, if I'm getting along with a queer person and we're hanging out and having fun, why? And they know that I'm like an ally and supportive of queerness, like, yes. I'm like, it's obvious. It doesn't, not necessarily obvious, but like, I think it is obvious because queer people have always found me. (laughs) Like, 
they have always found me. I have always been, I've been always been marked safe. People know that I'm just like, I'm going to get it. People don't ever think I'm homophobic. <laughs> I've really never, ever had a homophobic allegation launched at me. Thank God. Um, but um, yeah, if, if we're hanging out and having a good time, what does my sexuality change about the situation? Like, what would my religion change about the situation? What would knowing my medical history change? Like, there's certain parts of my identity that it's like, when it comes up, it'll come up. Like, my job's not very important to me. So I don't ask people about their jobs. It doesn't matter to me. When it comes up, it'll come up. But there's not homophobia for jobs. There's classism, actually. So there's forms of this in, like, any part of your identity. But I think the intersections of identity and sexuality it's the, the intersection is, is moving a couple blocks every few months in terms of queer culture. And for me, I don't know if you're asking me to diagnose you and, you know, give you moral, you know, green light you morally. But no, I think it's I think it's fine if sexuality isn't as strong in your identity as somebody else. I have a lot of gay friends. They're extremely gay. They love it. They're proud of it. But it's actually not that big in their identity. Like, it's not like their top three things. Like, they'd probably say they're like a gamer and they like to hike before they would say uh, gayness is like a huge part of who I am. But I think we're at a, po a point where it's like a lot of people think that you're supposed to like, like if someone else, if their queerness is like the most important, loudest thing about them, like most defining part about them they might project that on other people and think that it should be that for them too. So I think you might be projecting on this person. I think queer culture might have projected something onto you that you might not necessarily agree with, which is that your queerness is the most defining part of you. But it's like, and even if it were, you don't have to disclose. I don't know. You can be, I think it's, I think there, I think there is a way to be private about your sexuality without, without it being internalized homophobia. It doesn't sound, I don't know. That's where I'm going to leave it. This is extremely nuanced. I'm glad we were able to talk about this on the pod today because these are topics I thought about and they're not actually very easy to talk about on the internet. So I'm accepting that I may have just stepped in some holes, but at this point in time, this is what I believe. And I'm not, I'm not, uh, not uh, thinking that I'm causing harm by saying these things, but if I'm terribly terribly if if I, have a, if I have a huge blind spot here I might um but the conversations I've had with my queer friends about this no one's ever made me feel like this is a bad way to be more reactions Patrick who's 43 in Seattle said reactions to death are completely unpredictable very true and there's no consistent grief reaction even within your own lifetime like I've lost several important people to me and my reaction to their death was different it's not like the grief felt the same it's very unique and personal and singular at such as this person Claire in Fort Collins she said the first time I ever heard of the sudden death of someone I knew personally and loved I laughed I knew that this was a common reaction, but I never thought I would be a death grief laugher. At least you knew it was a common reaction because if you didn't, in this case, if you didn't know, you might think, oh, Lord, that felt wrong. But no, it's it's you can react however you want. On the other side, Olivia in the Bay Area said, I recently got some bad news about my grandpa's health and I was much calmer about it than I expected. So, yeah, sometimes you feel like if someone's health has taken a turn, you're supposed to be like forlorn but sometimes it feels so wrong but you just it doesn't impact you that much it might come out later it might compound you know it's like i just don't think we should be judging ourselves based on our reactions anonymous in the uk said someone telling me that they just want to be friends with me was a reaction where it felt different i thought i felt the same but hearing that i responded very emotionally turns out rejection hurts even when you don't want the thing you're being rejected for it's like yeah you might not have even wanted to be more than friends but it's like still like oh it still can impact you i love that that's very true i'm sorry that you experienced that but like it is very true that rejection even if it's not something you really wanted still doesn't feel good 
One more time from Quirked Up Shoddy. I'm really representing a lot of her viewpoints this time. I told my most recent ex that I loved him during a tense conversation, and it was a total flop. We should have broken up that night, but I, but I entertained his already avoidant attachment style for a few more weeks before I dipped. It was a Hail Mary of sorts because we didn't even date long enough for me to say it in the first place. But the petrified fear in his eyes when I said it will haunt me every time I entertain saying it to someone in a romantic context going forward. No, no, it's like, oh, it really sucks when you want to bear all your feelings to somebody and they are so emotionally unavailable that they cannot even entertain it. You know, it's like you should feel safe and free to express every emotion with somebody. And if you don't feel that way about them, you should not be in a relationship with them. I'm glad that you're no longer together because it's like you shouldn't feel guarded about your emotions, especially with someone who you're looking to like build a life with. It's like you should feel like you trust them and they trust you and you can say what you need to say or let the words fall out. Honestly, real ones will know that reference. Okay. Oh, this is a good one. Allie, who's 29 in South Carolina, said, In one of my college dorm rooms, someone tried to break in once. He lived above us but was high and confused and thought his roommates were pranking him. I had three roommates and we all reacted so differently to one another. It really brought forth our personalities and showed how we handle stress. I immediately called the RA. One locked her own individual door and hid under the covers. One started pacing the room and the other became the muscle leaning against the door to protect. It's so interesting to see people's material reactions to a situation like this when you're in danger because I had a situation like this when I, my parents were visiting and I thought my parents would be the one to step in and take action and you know lean against the door. I was the one to do that and my mom just screamed and my dad just stood in the doorway and I was like, how come I'm the most active one when I'm the kid? It was so bizarre, but I was like, it was just, I would never expect my parents to react that way. Krista in Seattle said, I recently told my mom about my boyfriend. We've been dating over a year now, and she didn't even ask his name. I thought I'd be livid and super hurt, but honestly, I feel at peace about it. I've known for a long time she has no real interest in my life since I left my ex and moved states, and this was just more evidence of that. I'm not surprised anymore, and I no longer feel the need to engage with her at this point. Oh, I'm heartbroken by this because it just sucks for your emotions to be neglected this way. It's like... They don't have to like sometimes I just feel like it just sucks when someone really just can't be fully happy for you and not fully curious about your life and someone that you've known for so long, such as your mom. It's like, ugh. need to um, give you the data on sibling risk taking now. OK, so with 47 responses, I pulled this a little early. We have in first place. With 61% of the votes, 61% of the oppo- supposed risk-taking, younger siblings, okay? 61% said younger siblings take more risks. And then it's a perfect three-way tie between older siblings, middle siblings, and no discernible difference. So overwhelmingly, people think younger siblings take more risks, but I was a counter to that. And I think anyone that said older siblings might be built like me. Finally, let's see if there's anybody from 10 years ago that you want to reconnect with. Kaylee, who's 24 in Vermont, said, my childhood best friend. I dream about her every week. I've tried to reach out but did not get a response. I don't remember why we stopped talking when we were 16. When it's been long enough, you don't remember. That's what a 10-year-old, like, 10-year-old relationship, it's like, why? You can't, it's too long to remember what, what actually happened. And the fact that you're dreaming about her every week, like, I would be so flattered if someone told me that they were dreaming about me every week, it's like, absolutely, I'd want to keep that relationship up if like, if I'm in someone's subconscious to that level. And the person that I'm like, trying to reconnect with, also my last couple of texts did not get responded to. So it, it discourages me, but I will not give up. I have faith that we're supposed to be in each other's lives. Like, we shared an intimacy once, I feel like it's just too much to lose. Okay, next person... Peyton in Toledo, Ohio, is 22, said, This question made me think of the volleyball team I was on about 10 years ago. I don't talk to any of the girls anymore, but at the time we were such great friends. We spent like 30 hours a week together between practices, tournaments, etc., and just had the most fun time being young girls together. As I've gotten older and I've made a lot more male friends, thanks engineering school, LOL, I look back and cherish that time in my life when I had such a strong bond with a large group of girls. I look back on those girls so fondly, even though the friendships were pretty short-lived. 
these types of things are hard to recover because it's like you're never going to recover like a team environment. Although I did hear from somebody in my jazz band that he had a reunion with like the cover band he was in in college. So sometimes you can have little reunions like that. But when it's like a team dynamic, those are hard to resurrect. One on one on one direct one on one dynamic you have more power over. Olivia, who's 23 in the Bay, said, I had this best friend in middle school who was at the time, who at the time was the closest and fastest friendship I'd ever made. We had a classic middle school falling out, and I still think about it sometimes. I think I mainly am curious what her life is like now. She's off social media, so I have no way of knowing. That's what I'm talking about. Like sometimes the people you're most curious about are the ones that aren't on social media. Addie, who's 24 in Minneapolis, said, One of my childhood best friends and I grew apart in our teens after I moved. She, she meant the world to me. We were inseparable. We promised to be bridesmaids at each other's weddings, and I stayed over at her house a lot after school because both of my parents worked. Her mom was like a second mother to me. I didn't end up being a bridesmaid in her wedding, and I don't think I'll ever get married, but I think, I ba- I think about her a lot. She just had her first baby, and given how close we were, it pains me that it feels awkward to even comment a simple congratulations on her social media posts. This is such a modern problem such a modern problem is that feeling of like we used to be so close and now i'm just commenting congratulations on your baby's instagram post like that's such a position to have with somebody and i've had positions like this where someone told me i was going to be in their wedding and then the wedding happens and it's like damn relationships can change so much like the width and the context of the relationship can move forms and shapes and it's like damn we're not even we thought for sure we were going to be like that and now we're not If you are here and still listening to my voice, I invite you to switch out of the app you're in, go to Instagram and follow at Revelatorium on Instagram. That's where I'm posting really fun little memes and hopefully snippets and other such materials from this thing so we can um, immortalize these confessions a little bit more because they're so fucking good. I'm so grateful to everyone that writes in because I learned so much about my experience through your experience. And I'm feeling very enlightened and hopeful for the month of April. I hope that you all can put away what was not helpful for March and take the rest. See you all next time. Thanks so much for listening and Catherine out.